Hello everyone and welcome to Film Independent Presents, our year-round screening and Q&A series. I'm Brian Sheehan with Film Independent. Thank you so much for joining us today to talk all things softy. First off, I'd like to thank some of our ardent supporters, our lead sponsor, the Hollywood Farm Press Association, and our screening partner, Vision Media. If you have a question uh, for the filmmakers, please use the Q&A button towards the bottom of your screen. Um, and hopefully we can get toward it, to it towards the end of our session. And today we have special guest moderators and filmmakers Jocelyn Barnes and Karen Chien. And without further ado, I will let both of them take it away from here. Thank you so much, Brian. It's such a pleasure to be here with Film Independent and talking to the incredibly talented filmmaking team behind Softy really powerful film. Um, this is a fantastic opportunity, this panel, to really dive into the process of the craft of the filmmaking and also what it means to make an international collaboration in the nonfiction landscape today. So uh, we have with us, again, my great producing colleague, Jocelyn Barnes, will be co-moderating the panel. Um, and I will introduce the panelists. We have Sam Soko, director, producer, and co-editor. Tony Kamal, producer, Bob Moore, executive producer, and Mila Ong Twin, executive producer, co-editor. So let's dive in to talking about the process of making this just really powerful film. Um, why don't we just start with the kind of general introduction to the project. How did this very global team meet? And please feel free to drop in where you're zooming in from. Um, how did the global team meet and collaborate around this film? You know, if you can take us through the journey, I think, which includes some pitching forums and as much detail as you can include for the filmmakers who are listening. <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks so much for for you know for doing this and having us because it's it's always been incredible to to not only chat about the film but kind of trying to remember and just think you know have this blissful memory of everything because you know everything in hindsight sometimes just looks so cool <laughs> even though it's been you know it's 2021 so now it's been like almost eight years since <laughs> everything started out and um, it all began with trying to make a short film to inspire activists, um, you know, like make a how-to guide of, develop, of, you know, how do you do a protest um, in the spaces which we grew up in when, where, you know, the police react the way they do, the governments react the way they do. And at the time, um, the, the, the subject of the film, Boniface Mwangi, it kind of still is one of the most flamboyant activists in Kenya was doing this crazy symbolic protests. So um, we talked to Boniface and we're like, hey, we can do this short video. And he was like, okay, cool, <laughs> let's, let's do something. So as we were making the short film, um, one protest kind of led to another protest. Like we just kept filming this protest, but then it kind of started developing into this film, this story where you seeing what he goes through behind the scenes. Like, you know, when he leaves a protest and goes home, he has to be a dad. And you kind of see the, the reaction and the experience that his family has and the sacrifices that the family has to make to accommodate the decisions that he makes. So that kind of contradiction and that kind of engagement and question became the journey of the film. So in executing this journey in a space where there is ultimately next to no money to do anything, um, I think I was lucky enough to attend a good pitch session, like a good pitch Kenya session that was organized by DocuBox, um, the documentary East African Fund, um, which is like the only documentary fund that exists in the East and Central Africa before Doc A came in, which is so cool. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I didn't want to correct you. <laughs> before documentary Africa came in, which, you know, we're growing now. Um, so when we turned a good pitch, I like on the side, um, I met um, Jess, 
just search from from Doc Society and did a terrible pitch of the film and somehow <laughs> it was terrible Tony it was so bad so but, it was yeah, terrible you just showed just, her the she loved it yeah because like i couldn't talk she was actually like what's the film about like i was like i kept mumbling and then she was like okay do you have anything and then i showed her <laughs> some footage i had on my phone and she was like this is so cool i was like you think it's cool and then um she, um, she asked to that i apply for uh some funding from doc society and at the same time we'd gotten some money from just films but then um, on a chance encounter on attending a Doc Society event at IDFA, I met Heidi, Heidi Ta from Hot Dogs Blue Ice, who asked me to apply to Hot Dogs. Mm -hmm. And when I applied to Hot Dogs, that's when I met Mila Ongpuing, who was my <laughs> mentor at Hot Dogs. <laughs> and Mila can tell you his first reaction when he heard me talk about the film. I thought it was boring. <laughs> it was, uh, wow. it, it was uh, so much footage and I was just like kind of annoyed at the main characters, uh, Bunny Fast, I thought he was kind of arrogant. And so Soko and I, I think had an ongoing argument about the footage for about a year. And then finally we sort like, I remember there was this one, I think we pr finally connected at Info. We were on a houseboat and you're like, I know you're at a film festival now, but why don't you just watch like four hours of footage with me instead? <laughs> and he gave me all this footage and they were like, oh, there's stuff here. So it was just, it was quite, quite a long journey, I think, to getting to an agreement on that. That was years. It was just to get, just to get your pitch out properly was years. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so crazy, like from, at the same time when I was talking to Mila about it was the same time I was talking to Tony about it. And I was like, Kenya, so you know, Nairobi. yeah, and and it's so because I think for a lot of filmmakers, and especially doc filmmakers, you start out, and you kind of have to figure out fundraising, and then you're trying to be uh, trying to do with a creative and film at the same time, and it's it's just too much. And that in 2017 was like the most intense period for the film, and at that time, um, I think that's when we also started having a lot of candid conversations with Tony. And towards the end of 2017, um, Tony was like, okay, let's, <laughs> let's try and see how we make this work. And at the same time, we were pitching up for the hot dogs forum. And Tony tells that story so much better than me. Uh, oh, nice segue. Um, nice segue. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, so I think you were talking to both of us at the same time. I remember a lot of our conversations were in kitchens. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah like when we, when you were, when we were working together and you were editing this other documentary, I Am Samuel, Pete's Doc. And yeah, the first time you said that you were going to do a documentary about Boniface Mwangi, I was like, another documentary about Boniface Mwangi. <laughs> the hundredth one okay <laughs> like what else are people gonna say and it's not to say that i mean he's a very fascinating person and ever since you know he won the cnn africa journalist he became a ted fellow like he was covered ad infinitum by you know by everyone like everyone had done a short everyone was trying to do a half hour on him so i think when you had said that the first time i was like okay let's see it's going to be a hagiography and i think when we slowly started talking and Sok, I think that's one of your greatest strengths, like the, you know, the longing and the slow burn, like you just keep on coming back with more. Because I remember every time you would be like, oh, I have this scene. And I think I watched the same scene that I'm suspecting Miller watched the scene where Boniface told Jerry he was running for an yeah. election. I think that's a scene that I don't know. I don't know, if Miller, that's a scene that you didn't like. Because when I watched that, I was like, damn, uh, okay. Um, this is an interesting. Yeah, I think we had the character. same experience. We both sort of fell in love with Najeri, and then before that, we're like, "Oh, there's another character in this movie. Tell me more." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I think it was interesting seeing that scene, and I don't know. I think also Bob, you had a reaction to that as well. But yours was, I don't know. I don't know if you had a reaction to that. Yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't like Boniface particularly, uh, and I thought that it was didn't really give a, a, a depth or anything. But I. I 
And Jerry was the one, yeah, who kind of secured it. Also, meeting Soko was curious in and of itself because I met. I thought he was trying to get a free bed to stay in or something. I was like, what's this, what's this guy? What's his angle here? Yeah. So is that a festival? Yeah. You don't know. You know, I was, it, it was hard to. It was just hard to make heads or tails. But it was one of those co- kind of conversations where Mila had told me which sometimes is difficult to, to, to decipher. I, I was like, how was the blue, how were the blue ice fellas? He was like, well, there was this one. I was like, but that doesn't, I don't know what that means necessarily, but, but the persistence of Soko and showing then once the material came to life, obviously then everything started, you know, to change. Yeah. For the better. Maybe the lesson yeah. is we all had our guard up too much. Maybe we should just be open. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I think it, it it's to kind of kind of connect everything together. It's the us going through all that process and meeting all these people. I think there was something in which all these people questioned and saw, and there was kind of response that they demanded and mm-hmm. and were asking for. And I think finding those answers and looking for them really helped us come together and kind of brought all of us together because um tony and i are based in kenya um we 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 try very hard to tell our stories from kenya um mila and bob um before covid were based in montreal (laughs) in canada and I think once we met and started speaking, I think even with Mila, there's a lot of nuances and and things that we wish we we shared um, because he um, a lot some of the time when I was editing and sharing some of the the material, he was in Myanmar in Burma in Myanmar, and there's like a lot of there were, there were many questions and there's just many synergies that we could find and you know. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's cliche but for sure the rest is history that's 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 <laughs> yeah, kind of like guess, summary of the journey of the film <laughs> yeah i guess maybe yeah i guess i, I think a lot of it like kind of like uh, at, at hot dogs forum because before like we segued into talking about that particular scene which was just one scene that showed an aspect of boniface because he's an amazing person but i think it was seeing that scene up front where you're like okay but when you see like his motivation like you had so much material that gave his backstory the fact that he was doing all of this because of his mother so like like when you start to see all the material and you see all the, he, you see he's a complex multi-dimensional human being you're like oh my god he's so interesting as well as jerry who had never really been on screen and i think one amazing moment um i think after we spoke <laughs> many times in the kitchen was when he got into hot dogs forum and we didn't know how to do a pitch i think we were the first kenyans to get in and i think that was a motivating factor to also speak to miller and bob and be like yo mm-hmm. So we're coming to Canada <laughs> and we're going to do this pitch. And, and somehow you went to Miller's house. Did you go to Miller's house? And you mm-hmm. worked on the trailer together, this incredible trailer. And I still like were really amazing at doing pitches. So uh, we worked with Miller, who's like, who's like a guru at pitches, at, at, at finding you know, the magic and worked together on the pitch. And then we did our pitch in person. Uh, being the first Kenyan team uh, pitching at Hot Dogs Forum. We didn't know what we were doing as such, but somehow like uh, we got a good response from audiences. And I think after we got a good response, then I think afterwards we were like, okay, maybe we could all do something together on this film. Mm-hmm. I think it was, I think that's a magical festival. Yeah. So things kind of yeah. happen. Yeah. But the um, other I, thing, Tony, if I, if I could just, say is that they they you you came in i think it's relevant maybe for the audience to know for for our participants here that you came in with kind of a justified confidence because you had like three or four years of material filmed Mm -hmm. already which is a high bar you know like the way soko's telling the story of how it finally comes through it's like he no one was listening to him basically until he could show exactly what was going on in the movie and that's that's 
certainly a high barrier to entry and you're coming out of Kenya and trying to get into the North American market. So basically people are like, show me a bunch of footage to prove that this is going to be an amazing film. So by the time you actually, you know, made a sort of definitive pitch of hot dogs, you had the material to back it up. And so everything could kind of move from there, you know, and that's something that kind of comes up sometimes. It's like when to, when to actually go in on, presenting to market or whatever and then that's also when we were able to be more helpful in a way yeah. you know it's, it's like it's, you had you had something you you had something to talk about <laughs> it's it, so. it's it's a very interesting experience to especially when you're coming from um in this case coming from kenya where mm. a lot of context is not known to the people you're talking to so we make a lot of assumptions whenever we are talking about the project or engaging with the project. And that's actually one of the biggest things that I've learned. And like, um, first, don't assume. So we, it was like, because whenever I would talk about the project for quite a bit of time, you would assume people understand what's happening in, thing, in Kenya and why it is the way it is. And and Mila would watch something and be like, who the hell is this guy? And I'm like, dude, you don't know the president of Kenya. And like, how do you not know the president of Kenya? And, and, and then you're like, what do you mean? As in like, oh, that's the president of Kenya. I'm like, yes. And you know, his father was also the president of Kenya. And you're like, oh crap, that's a thing. And, it, and I'm like, oh yeah, I, I sh you should kind of have this, con there's a way in which you, you engage in the material that is beyond the material as well. And, and that kind of helps, particularly in bridging that gap. And I think I get on the other end as well, you, you also want to talk to people who are interested in what you're talking about. And I think a lot of the time, it's that's kind of problematic. But in, in this case, it was really cool that, you know, there was a back and forth in that conversation. So there was like an understanding of context and a lot of things made sense eventually at the end of the day. Sam, you raise a, a really interesting point in terms of, you know, the, the context and the content. I mean, I think in the United States, people, the, the general public here is so disconnected from what leadership is doing um, and doesn't realize that decisions are being made in Washington, whether through multilateral institutions like World Bank or the IMF or through our own government. Um, and you know, as outside of certain trade policies that may or may not make it into mainstream media, but don't realize the effect that we are having um, mm -hmm. very concretely on people's lives elsewhere in the world. And every time I see you know, a US president get off an airplane, I know that an arms deal is being done. And it's, um, this, is, this is just like, people don't actually realize this because it's not really reported on and the access to international news here, there's so much less spending now on that than there mm -hmm. used to be. Um, so yeah. I think in terms of you know, the history of Kenya, it's, in, it's interesting how you all um, work together on this. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about the collaboration both in terms of how it's structured as a co-production, like what the mechanisms are, but also if you could talk a little bit about whether that collaboration affected the content or the analysis that you brought inside of the story. Um, so there's a heavy emphasis, for example, on, on ethnicity and tribalism in the film and things like this that maybe could be you know, relevant um, to how you might have talked about it. And, and Tony, you know, obviously, please jump in because I know that you yeah. had, a, you were, as the producer together with Sam, you know, involved in setting up the structure for this, thinking it mm -hmm. through. Yeah, and, and I, 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 I think we, we, we can we can talk. Um, I think Mila and I can talk because we had the most fights in terms of <laughs> connecting, um, bringing the the like the story and nuance of the story through, um, but. In a way, there was a saving grace, which is like a weird thing to say that Trump was president because it, we, were dealing with, we were dealing with evidence because, you know, Americans were going through what we've been going through for a very long time. So when, when we were editing the film and I was explaining like, like, this is the story of Kenya 
it was more of like, oh, so the leadership takes advantage of the ethnicities that exist. And it was like, just like America. <laughs> like, and you have presidents who, you know, declare things and, you know, they just say, this is not what we want or this is what we want, like, just like America. And when we were having those conversations and building those, that kind of information, in the beginning, the story was meant for Kenyans. Like, I was like, this is a film I am making to have Kenyans reflect on their situation and the decisions they make. However, because of the incredible connection that was there with the world and everything that was happening to the world, Mila was, would, would kind of engage with the film and be like, this doesn't make sense to me. How does it make sense to me? So when, when we would try and switch and engage, and I'm really grateful to the other editor, Ryan, who really helped us kind of just like break the structure of the film and kind of find form in, in the time and how everything would flow. Because from at what point should we talk about what colonialism, the effect of colonialism? Um, in in how it's affected the different ethnic backgrounds in Kenya and having them fight against each other. That led to incredible violence in 2007 and eventually just kept repeating itself. And at what point do we bring how Cambridge Analytica influences our elections and like culminating in everything? And those for me i was coming from a very point of like i live it i experience it in a in you know because i'm here mm -hmm. but it helped to have someone who was like okay this is how i'm able to understand it so it was like this is a bit too much this is a bit too little and kind of try to find that balance and i think eventually somehow i think it came through mila i don't know what you think oh i mean i think it was a constant sort of back and forth about like, because you didn't really reveal to me, and I don't think the most people in your pitching, that this was a, fam a family drama, a story about a family. And that was like a secret ambition of yours. Like, oh, I really filmed with the kids and with Boniface and Najeri. But and when you would pitch it, you would say, it's a story about Kenya and this one leader who's a hero. And it was sort of like secretly hidden in your footage how great it was. And then I would dig and say, hey, these are good scenes. Maybe we should make the film about the family as well. You'd be like, no kidding. You'd be like, it was like a, it was like a little trap that you set. But then I'd be like, but then we sort of have to explain the history of Kenya, don't we? Like, and you're like, no kidding. You're like, so finding the balance between the two that you'd always sort of intended to do became obvious the more that we dug into the footage as like complete dummies. Mm -hmm. We were like, we don't know anything. And so we had to piece together like what you were like you couldn't explain it to us in the beginning we had to like, it, it was always it. like you know i know because the first time when we were pitching like i was talking to you i was telling you like every person you try to pitch a story about a family um engaging in a situation would be like the story of activism is so much better the yeah. story of Ken is so much better and th that again is kind of an experience you have when you're trying to tell your story because a lot of the time people tell you what they think is a good story and sometimes you're scared to talk about it because everybody else is like, you know, the story of Kenya and activism and the activists is so much better. And I'm lucky to have someone like Milo is like, okay, maybe this thing makes sense. But it also kind of also, when, when we're going to pitch now, again, just kind of how we structure the deal and, and Tony can speak to that, it yeah. affected how, who, and how we, who, whoever we were talking to about the film. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's an interesting point, um, you know, Miller, that you bring up that this family story was hidden because I think as filmmakers coming from Africa, Kenya, there are certain kind of films that get funded. So when you go mm -hmm. out into the space, like if I was Dutch, I could do, a documentary about my cat loving tan furniture and it would get funded by everyone and I'm sure that's a great documentary but I'm just saying like this because there's a lot of like public funding in such spaces where and you know there's 
I guess it's like a more equal society. So th there's certain kind of films that you can get funded out of different spaces. But in Africa, it has to be either about like a big activist or, you know, like um, a, a female, like, I don't know, like um, president, uh, uh, she's, she's trying to run for presidential seat. So it's always like these large stories, this story is writ large and the ordinary, um, you know, stories of just the, the mundane life, you know, like, like what was amazing about like soft tea was that it was about a marriage. It was about a young marriage. There was a parallel. It was about a young marriage between Boniface and Jerry, and also a young marriage between Kenya and Kenyans, because we are a young democracy. And what was amazing about it was that you're able to draw those parallels. But I think it was also just going into that space and not understanding that maybe as filmmakers from Kenya, we are allowed to just talk about the ordinary and everyday experiences and that can actually get funded and that can actually get seen. Um, so I think that was also something that we had to kind of give ourselves permission for and which is what was amazing, I think, about your collaboration with Mila and Ryan um, to be able to just understand, you know, um, those aspects about what kind of story you can actually tell that will get seen. Um, and I think just briefly, just in terms of how we structured it, and I think Bob, because we had lots of conversations back and forth, and I think our biggest challenge was there's no co-production between Kenya and Canada. Like, how on earth are we going to make this work? Um, so, and I, I know that was a conversation that we had because, you know, uh, Soko was a Kenyan director, Kenyan producer, um, uh, public money from Canada, like, needs to go to... Um, Kenyan directors or if it's a co-production. So what we ended up doing was um, outside of the local co-production between Soko's company, LBX Africa, and my company, We're Not the Machine, LBX Africa ended up having another um, arrangement uh, with I Steel Film, uh, which I think Bob can talk about because we were still able to uh, cleverly unlock some Canadian financing through that. Yeah. Well, thanks, Tony. You know, to me, I think the you're saying there's no treaty between Canada and, and Kenya. Obviously, for the for the filmmakers in the room, there's no treaty between the U.S. and anyone. The whole treaty system is meant to counterbalance you guys. So, um, you know, there was this if it was another country, maybe there's this possibility of sharing the rights. Each country can kind of claim status and, and whatever. But that actually invites an, uh, a sort of level of what we might call kind of colonial filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And this situation presented us with a very interesting challenge to not do that um, because it was clear that there was a Kenyan director and a Kenyan producer and we wanted to work on it. And the solution to get easy Canadian money was to basically subsume them completely, which was not an option for mm -hmm. us. So uh, we went with a service production agreement and all rights stayed in Kenya and we just went sort of outside of the system, but did something that reflected reality. Instead of working the financing and then, and then figuring out how that, you know, how the film has to look as a result of that, we're like, what is the film presenting us from a production standpoint? And how do we build a structure to reflect that? And, and uh, it was kind of key that Tony existed as somebody who could kind of run the production on their end while uh, Soko's, you know, running the creative at that point, you know, it had to basically move over to that almost entirely. Um, but, but that's sort of that balance of us being able to use our group in Montreal through interna basically international financing, right? Like big broadcast pre-sales and some international funds and stuff and like a little bit of tax credit money. Um, but, but going away from the, I, I think the treaty system, which can, you know, Joss and Karen, you know, this can sort of offer up some enticing opportunities and also some really weird traps in terms of how the film ends up being, uh, ends up actually existing in terms of rights and, and representation in the final production. Uh, so we've, we've been really, I don't know, for, for me, it's been, you know, one of the, the great successes of how to put a project together in this way. We've been really happy about it.
But it's funny because we're both kind of de we were both kind of de incentivized to work together in so many steps. And I remember like <laughs> it's so cool. Like we had to like secretly Robin Hood money to back and forth. And then so yeah, I remember yeah. like if, if you took all the opportunities offered to you, you would have to make like what you used to call an NGO film. And you're like, I don't want to make an NGO film because that's <laughs> give me money, make that kind of bullshit. Yeah. And then we were like, we're supposed to make films with Canadian directors about Canadian subjects. How do we get around <laughs> all this money that's offered at us for to make these lousy films? So it's it's very interesting to be. I mean, we obviously your footage is so good, we would find a way. But it was like it's it's weird, eh? How how the money always pushing you towards one kind of thing. I think that's my part for um. Oh, sorry. No, please, Tony. Yeah. No, I was just gonna say that's why I think um hot dogs forum it was such an amazing it triggered i mean it was such an amazing opportunity for the project because that's where we got pov um and as much as that we'd had like financing from just films and doc society but pov coming on board as a co-producer as a u.s co-producer um literally on the lunch line after um our pitch at hot dogs forum i think that was able to at least give us some, it took a while to, of course, like solidify the deal as it always does. But I think that was, that also just gave us some leeway and some, some space to actually start editing as we figured out how on earth we were going to fill up the rest of the budget, which is mostly grant money. Um, so I would just say like, yes, there's always that conundrum about like, how do you do co-productions and things like that. But I just, I think, yeah, those kind of pitching forums are really great. And I, I love the way Hot Docs is designed um, to be able to bring those kind of um, deals to the table. No, it's a, it's a great testament, you know, the story of the making of your film to what we all have been missing for a year and will be going on even more, which is the ability to gather together you know, the ex the texture and the encounters and and the um, just the discoveries we make when we can come together, whether it's for a film festival or a market or pitching forum and how much of that network is necessary for an international co-production. Um, we have a question from the, uh, from the attendees, but before we get to that, I just wanted to ask you to speak a little bit more about what Mila talked about, um, about where, money being offered, uh, which is sometimes a good problem to have, but pushing you towards a creative or content directions you don't want to go in. Um, how, you know, given that you, your team exists around the world, how were you coming to agreement or alignment on those decisions? Was it constant conversations and dialogue around that? Ooh. Uh. <laughs> more fighting <laughs> so i think i think it it really one thing um in you know sometimes you think about it and you're like how did that happen is i honestly feel mila and i existed as siblings in another world because somehow that's not a fight we ever had like it was always very clear where we wanted to go and it was never a point of like we're going to take a detour or someone is going to say this is a place where we, we can stay or whatever because every like <laughs> every time because I spent quite a bit of time at Mila's um, edit when we we're editing the film but even when I'd be back in Kenya and you know the time difference was crazy we would have conversations for like two hours into which is what is like 1 a.m our time to 2 a.m our time about the film and about like a crazy idea that he thought about or ha I thought about or any scenes that we were working on. And even when there was a question of perhaps we could, the you know, because of fundraising or because of every, anything and just having Bob and Tony there, cause you know, they're like, they're handling it. it you, you kind of feel you have the buffer to take whichever risks that you want to take. And they're pretty chill about risks. <laughs> so, cause just if the same example of the hot dogs pitch, literally what happened was Tony and I had sat down and we were like, this is how we've seen people pitch. 
and we came up with a pitch and <laughs> sorry spoke to, we spoke to Mila about the pitch and Bob and Mila was like are you sure this is how you want to pitch and I was like you know what I want to do the craziest thing but I don't think anybody would let us do it and Mila was like what is that and I was like how about we just talk through everything and Mila was like that's something we can do because I'd watched a pitch that they had done that was very similar. But the whole, the one thing he said is like, it is very risky. And I was like, you either do it or you go home. Like, what the hell? Let's do it. <laughs> and, and so it was so, and that kind of set the precedent of this is how we're going to do this. Whether, and just even Bob saying, We've seen, we've talked about the film, we've seen the material, and we're going to make this film. We don't know where the money's going to come from, but the film's going to be made. And because that kind of just allows you to push and keep pushing. Yeah. I, I think with those funders that we attracted, we were lucky that we had found partners that some of us had worked with before that were mm -hmm. trusted people, like the Sundance Fund. That's pretty much a no-brainer, like, oh, good partner. And then POV, it's like, I can't really imagine a better creative partner than POV in terms of like uh, broadcast TV in terms of like non-interference, but also having like such clout and, and then doc society, like we worked with them before. So it was like, that was really lucky that we had, we didn't have difficult choices, you know, of like, Oh, here's a brand new hedge fund that wants to invest but in strings attached. No, it was all like kind of safe people. I would say, Bob, that were the offers we were getting were. Yeah. Like there were this, this project actually was kind of hot, was like blessed in that moment. Uh, that's why Tony keeps bringing up hot dogs. It's true that that week was very transformational for the, for the film. Uh, there were some, there, I think there's some kind of wonky things that we are, have suppressed in our memories, opportunities that we were all like, no, that's stupid. And, <laughs> and you know, that's to me. Well, I there was that woman who will, who will go un, unnamed, who, who bought, who said, yes, I'll buy the pitch at the forum. And then, Right. And then rescinded uh, no, yeah. her, uh, She was 100% in and then 100% out. <laughs> that's, Someone that's always important. has a boss, you know, that's the thing. But luckily but, we replaced her with the BBC, which was, you know, 10 times uh, more. Some, yeah, exactly. But to, to me, the takeaway from this was that we vet, it's like we vetted each other on a personal level. Our, like, like th so the key, the key joining pieces, right? Like Tony and I got put together because Mila and Soko had had done this dance for like years by the time we were working on the film we, we we knew who each other were kind of so the groups kind of can extend but the two people at the center of a co-production have to be you have to understand where the other person is in the world you know and so if there's like some fundamental disagreement in terms of how you see the world like that's where things can get really sticky on mm -hmm. agreeing about funders and it's like oh i thought this whole thing was actually a like a, a long play to do a fictionalization it's like what like you don't even care about doing the doc you know like that's <laughs> the kind of thing that that you know we don't we wouldn't want to enter into or whatever so we we knew by the time we we were faced with sitting with financing partners we were all pretty much on the same page but we were also lucky that we yeah once you have pov and all that it's like you're kind of rolling along a little bit yeah and people don't only half happen. the financing you know but it's like yeah. you're, you're moving <laughs> we have we have um yeah. we have some questions coming in now from some of yes, uh, the other participants no but i i think it's a lot of these questions are relevant to some of the points that you're making and and there you know there is this kind of ongoing conversation in the documentary community about the extent to which films are passively experienced um and or you know films that are more Act, that inspire a kind of more of an active reflection. Um, and there is this imperative in funding, I think, especially when it's North-South funding, there's a, a, a pretty constant refrain about whether or not a film is inspiring um, calls for action, change, social change, um, and how a film is being received on the ground. So can I just ask you, because there's a couple questions about this, how is the film being received in Kenya and what have the opportunities been for showing it on the continent in general? Because it's, of course, what's happened in Kenya is also mirrored in what's happened in Zimbabwe and most recently in Uganda. And 
it's you know the tribalism that you refer to in the film also of course has you know Rwanda famously has a similar history in some ways so I just wonder uh, about that and secondly to what extent do you think films should inspire change um, or whether the, the, that burden should be on the film um, mm -hmm. and whether that's because that you know this is the kind of film this is the kind of story that is often funded mm -hmm. Well, that's an that's an interesting question. I, so I could speak I could speak to the reaction, um, yeah, on the ground. So our initial plan after Sundance um, was that we wanted to make sure we got the film to Kenya as quickly as possible because we didn't want to be those filmmakers who take the film around the world for like two years and then we're like, oh, hi Kenyans, um, you can. I guess when you get some time, you can come and watch the film. So we didn't want to be those filmmakers. Like it was something that we were very conscious about. Like, so the original plan was to um, release it in June uh, because there was a significant date in Kenya around that. Um, uh, but then because of COVID, that wasn't possible because of Kenyan laws and curfews. So we just kept on trying to figure out when can we release this film? So October was also a significant um, date in Kenya's history um, when we decided to release the film, you know, just around like Independence and Heroes Day. There, there were a bunch of interesting um, events happening then. And Kenya had kind of opened up a little bit in terms of allowing people to go to theaters. So the reason why we wanted to take it to, to do a theatrical release in Kenya was for a number of reasons. Um, one, we really wanted to eventize it and not have Kenyans, because the perception of documentaries in Kenya is that, okay, I'm going to get lectured about why we need 10 more wells in North <laughs> Kenya. Um, and why I should fund them. Um, and I say that because there are a lot of documentaries about wells in Kenya for some reason. So, so for a lot of, <laughs> for a lot of- NGO, NGO films, yeah. Very NGO films. That in, that in well, but, but, It's a thing, like it's a thing, like some of these documentaries <laughs> are like, okay, wells or malaria. So what we really wanted to do, make people understand was because we also have a nascent, um, I would say emerging um, um, uh, uh, industry in Kenya around like these kind of feature documentaries. So we wanted people, we wanted to eventize it, get people out um, um, into the theaters and for them to understand this is an entertaining story. Um, it's character driven. It's, you know, it's, it's cinema. On the edge of your seats. So even a lot of like our framing when we were releasing it, because uh, we were lucky we got support for, for our, our release uh, from one of our funders. Uh, we were lucky we had funders who kept on doubling down on their support along the way. So we were very careful about the release just to make sure that we centered it on the family drama and you know, the fact it's about their marriage, you know, you've never seen this side. Like we didn't say, oh, it's a documentary that also talks about um, issues that we have around <laughs> divorce and voting. But we, we kind of kept that in the back burner to kind of like, kind of like Trojan horse, it was a Trojan horse people into, into, into watching a documentary that also talked about democracy. And that helped us because it really got people into the theaters. Like we were number one in the box office for like over four weeks, five weeks. This was the first time a documentary had ever been in the theaters. I remember when we were dealing with our distributors, they were like, documentary, really? Like we had to force the distributors to watch the documentary. Like we had to just keep on calling them, have you watched it? Have you watched it? And then when they watched it, they were like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I think it was interesting because also the response from audiences, um, especially middle-class who could afford to go to the theaters was, 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 was interesting because they saw themselves to a certain degree in Boniface's life. Um, you know, they're more, they're more middle class. And then some of them were asking themselves questions about like, oh, okay, he kind of lives in a similar neighborhood as me and he's doing all these things and making all these sacrifices. So what am I doing? And I think that's kind of like where we are in terms of like audience reactions and what we're trying to um, deal yeah. with in terms of our impact, yeah. And the thing that's been interesting is after that, after the release of the film, like, of course, we had a lot of reaction to, because, you know, the Kenyans who'd watched it were talking about it on social media and sharing it, and other Africans were 
engaging with it. And the challenge we do have in Af- we have like a, a big distribution channel in Africa, a uh, challenge in Africa. Like, where do we take these films? But not only where, because we either have to give the films for free, like, you know, just put it out there and be like, okay, let it go. Um, that means you put it on YouTube or something like that. Um, because unless, say, you're bought by Netflix or by another network, which is Showmax, Showmax, Showmax Mnet, there's really no one else who would buy documentaries. So, or just films. So what, what happened was because of the reactions we were getting and something you were speaking about, Jocelyn, of how our experiences are shared in the immediate, like they're not saying that this is something we're experiencing five years ago, 10 years ago. It's like, this is things that people are going through. We engaged with certain partners who who do have platforms, but you know, they they then we, we can kind of co-share, you know, hope that you know if people can pay and then we kind of share in in the money we get in. And we managed to kind of self-release in a couple of other countries. So we released in East Africa, that's Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, and we were available in Nigeria and we we're available in in South Africa. But again because of the reasons why we made the film and you're like the things are so urgent um some crazy things were happening in uganda and are still happening in uganda and we kind of spoke to the distribution partner that we had and were like you know we have to find a way to get ugandans to watch this film even if it's just as a sign of camaraderie so we made the film free during like during the week of the election in Uganda and it's actually free in Uganda for the next two days journey yeah it's until and that, you know crazy presidents shut down the internet yeah so the crazy dude shut down the internet because I don't know for you know so when the internet came back we're like it's fine we're still gonna make it free because <laughs> we still have to watch the film um but the idea of that in kind of tying into the second question is there's a lot of pressure that is put on films to make a difference and i my opinion is especially coming from an african context is we we lag behind in just archiving our own histories with our own voices like that's a place we are we are behind and it's that's a place where we have to start and something we have to do so for me it's not necessarily putting that stress on the stories or the films but a means of just reflecting that this is something we've gone through this is an experience we've had if it changes your mind great but this is a truth i will leave with you and maybe 10 years from now maybe 20 years from now people will watch it and they'll be like oh crap this has been happening for all this time and that's been an experience a lot of kenyan audiences have been having um a lot of people would say like they feel like they've been hit by a train because they're like it is true that these are the decisions we make and this is the consequence of these decisions so it's i don't think a film can do so much some have but I think it's important to keep that record and, you know, just keep it as a truth for posterity. We, uh, we often say that it's really hard to tell who's a truth teller. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's interesting how sometimes in films, it's so clear who a truth teller is and how the filmmaker or, or the participants in the film can be the truth tellers and how important, and I think we've all seen here in the States in the last four years uh, and, <laughs> and a long time before that, but we'll just focus on the last four, um, <laughs> how important truth is um, to help people make decisions about their lives and how invested people are who want to retain their power are in creating a, a kind of situation where you can't discern who a truth teller is. So I think it's so beautifully said what you just said. Um, yeah, thank you for 
Thank you for saying it that way. <laughs> can I can I ask you guys? I mean, just to go back to the co-production thing one one more time because I think it relates also to, to truth telling. Um, there is this, you know, there are these imperatives and um, to meet a marketplace. And Karen and I have talked about this a lot and um, we work together a lot. And in, in terms of, you know, it seems to me like you guys are, are participating, all of you are participating in the creation of the audience that you wanna see rather than trying to jam yourselves into a perceived market. And really market is a perception. And so, it's kind of an antidote in a way to the algorithm. It's like algorithms are useful in one way, but when they create niches, those niches can also become siloed and segregating. Um, so I wondered if you could talk about the experience of international co-productions in terms of maintaining your own independence, because there is a way in which that whole structure and this kind of archipelago of institutions that have come up across the continent that are working together and DocuVox and, and DOCA and before that Maisha and across North Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, Southern Africa in, and South-South partnerships matter so much. Um, I wondered if you could speak to that in relation to independence and to the independence of your voices as well as the, your experience. I'll say something really briefly while, while we were collect is that we have often joked that the higher the number of partners on a project, the more um, independence. The, there's sort of a there's sort of a, a very simplistic algorithm there. Um, that you know, if we'll do a project for one partner, you might call you might also call them a client. In that case, the you're kind of working for that person. So having balancing out the copro model works well when you have like sometimes people will make fun of it, like 17, 18, 20 partners on a project or something, you know, uh, across the world. And it's like, well, no, everybody is in on the journey together in that case. So editorially, the only central point is the film team. That's very significant, you know, compared to basically taking a sole commission on a, on a project. So that, that's, that's one thing that I, I just from the, from, in terms of like the market relationship during production. But in terms of how, how, to, how to build audience, <laughs> that's uh, no yeah. answer there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kind of feel like because, and it's not to, and it's not to like um, deify ourselves and to say we're the first to do everything. But honestly, because we are an emerging industry, I think we are freed from expectations to a certain degree um like in terms of when you're talking about algorithms algorithms need data so if you're talking about like what do people watch in africa like let's say for example streamers like netflix like how much data do they have around that or like how much african content actually exists for them to be able to make such decisions so i i feel like because at the time when we were trying to get softy made and when all of these other documentaries were getting made, story was first. Um, and I would say like one of the kind of earliest finances of independent documentary, DocuBox at the time in East Africa, um, Judy, who's the founder, who's also a docker with you, uh, Joss, um, is very story driven and she's very filmmaker centric. It's like, what story do you want to tell? Like that was our agenda at the time. Like what story do you want to tell? You have the freedom for the first time to not tell an NGO story. So what are you going to tell? And I think that's kind of like, I think because we're kind of like building the industry, this independent documentary industry from the ground up. And we are actually creating audiences because like right after we got soft tea in the theaters, another film, which is Kenya's uh, foreign language entry, The Letter also went to the theaters and also, you know, was selling out. So it, it just feels like we're in this interesting, exciting space. I know I'm deviating a little bit from what you're saying, but I feel like we're in this interesting, exciting space in East Africa. Yes, distribution is an issue. Um, you know, route to market is really difficult, but but it's a time for us to also just start slowly building these audiences and re-educating people 
Um, the, but the other thing that you did, Tony and, mm -hmm. and Soko, is that you guys took that independence and, and went with it. Because the flip side to the independence, especially with the, when we're, you know, to go back to this notion of like uh, North American money or European money for African films, is there's this kind of condescending attitude that can happen where it's like you come up with a cut and people are like, oh, you made a movie. Great. You know, it's like that's not good enough. And you guys, you guys didn't rest on anything, you know, it's like, the, uh, so those two films are a good example of like not, be, you know, you could have gotten the money and made something mediocre and then got no audience. The challenge, it didn't, the independence didn't remove that fundamental challenge. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's building, it's building um, not only, I think there is the building of the audience, but it kind of goes in tandem with building of the craft. Because the we 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 can't hide from the fact that it was always a challenge for say if it was only Tony and I, and being like we are talking to all of these people, they, they would look at you for who are you, like what, you know how why would I trust you? Because you're like what like there's there is something to be said with having or finding partners who are capable to take a jump and leap with you that allows audiences as well to eventually see that product, to eventually see that film and allow you to exhibit the craft that you're building and also learning and engaging with that craft. Because if because whatever the algorithms and all what whatever they do again like what tony said they're all based on the data they have but what data do they have because if if we're talking with we're like how many documentaries have ever come from kenya for someone to say that kenyans don't like documentaries so it it's it's <laughs> it, it's kind of like it, it's and i think that's one huge lesson our local distributor learned because we we were the biggest film in kenya in 2020 and More than it, exactly and they're like and we are documentary so for them it was like oh crap it, it's something that can happen and so for consequent documentaries that are going to come they're going to be viewed as cinema and less as documentaries and they're going to be viewed as stuff as, and the kind of audiences they are create, like an audience is going to watch the film feeling like it's this film is going to take me on a journey and they don't have to be boxed in the group that you only like rom-coms that are made this way. And that's, that's a journey that we have to continue to take and have to build on. Cause if, you know, if it takes us another five years to make another film, or encourage other filmmakers to make another film, that audience is going to be boxed back into what the algorithm is going to say. <laughs> yeah. I, I think one of the balances that we did have a lot of fun doing in the edit room was saying, I, I would be like, I wonder if a Canadian audience would, would understand this and like this. And you were like, will this work for a Kenyan audience? And we were constantly trying to like jockey for position of like explaining this or explaining that. And it was, I think we did find so much common ground that was fun that like, <laughs> I, I like think with the music. Yeah, and like, could we just amuse each other and ourselves with <laughs> this film was like, I would probably say 90% of the editing. And we were mm -hmm. like, it was like, if we can like it, then probably we'll maybe we're like, we were betting like the audience in each country like might follow suit. It was kind of a weird risk, I think, to take too, but it was yeah. <laughs> we could have just been giggling in the edit room for, for two years also, but yeah. I didn't doubt it. It doesn't sound like a bad way to spend a couple of years making a film. I mean, that's, um, I think there's something in this film that hits home for everyone watching it. I think that's part of the magic of it. And what, um, Sam, you just talked about is a really inspirational note to end on. I mean, for this film to be the number one film at the Kenyan box office is just incredible. So, you know, congratulations and thank you to the four of you for making this film and also not just for making the film and persevering through that already difficult process, but putting in the work to build the infrastructure 
and build your audiences, you know, in in East Africa and around the world. Um, I th I think this was a fascinating conversation. I hope the dialogue continues as your film continues to make its way through the world. And thank you again for your time and thank you, Film Independent.